I've been uh, wanting a dash cam for some time and after a bit of research I eventually decided on this thing. Now uh, up front I just need to say that this is effectively a sponsored video as this uh, VFO A119S was given to me by banggood.com and there will be links below to the camera on banggood.com. Having said that, uh, I haven't committed to saying anything in particular, uh, especially anything positive, so if I don't like it, I'm not going to be afraid to say so. Now, uh, in various comparison reviews that are out there, which I'm not trying to duplicate here, this uh, 1080p Full HD high definition camera uh, comes out amongst the top recommendations for, uh, let's say, mid range dash cams. Um, the ballpark price point is about a hundred US dollars, uh, so you can definitely spend more money. Uh, but I feel that with the um, advent of uh, 4K camera technology, um, which we're sort of transitioning to at the time of recording. Um, that buying a premium dash cam is probably worth delaying until the 4K versions become more common and uh, more cost effective. Uh, now I realize that the original A119 version of this thing is uh, 1440p as opposed to 1080p, uh, which sounds like a nice resolution increase, um, but it uses a slightly cheaper camera chip, whereas this, the A119S, um, has a Sony chip inside it um, and also a slightly faster optical lens attached to it, uh, both of which combine to give uh, better low light performance, in theory at least. So um, I figure it's important to level out performance with a dash cam. Uh, there's no point in having excellent daylight video and then poor nighttime footage. Uh, if you have some accident in the dark, you know, what's the point? So it's better to slightly compromise the daytime footage with regard to the resolution uh, if it's going to be paid back at night. So other reasons in this thing's favor are its uh, general design. It's very compact and uh, quite subtle. You can see how small it is in my hand. Uh, and it just attaches directly to the windscreen without a huge articulating suction pad mount type thing. Uh, it just uses this adhesive pad so it shouldn't be very noticeable from the outside when it's installed in the car. And uh, one notable feature that separates it technically from the cheaper section of the market is its use of capacitors for power buffering uh, instead of batteries, uh, which is something that should make it more reliable in hot weather as dash cams tend to get really cooked and batteries just don't do well in those conditions. That comes with a long, uh, USB cable um, for um, installation and also in here is the um, that's the USB cable and then there's the um, cigarette lighter um, phone charger style power supply and these are um, mounts to use now those are the non GPS mounts as you can see I've got the GPS mount so I won't be using them. Well, there's a replacement adhesive pad. And these, I believe, are a uh, dampening pads. So this would go positioned on there like this, making sure to keep the contacts clear. I don't know why it's not supplied already attached, but that's supposed to fix um, what I believe was an earlier problem with um, there being uh, movement courtesy of vibration from the um, from the connection between these and that just uh, dampens it down and isolates the camera more from the car. So like I said it has a uh, optional GPS component which you just saw me take off and put back on which doubles as the, the windscreen mount. Now the GPS logs uh, obvious data and uh, sorry location and speed data to uh, go along with the video for later perusal or evidence uh, and it also conveniently keeps the internal clock accurate in terms of time. And finally there is a, another optional 
uh, accessory, this uh, polarizing filter, uh, which is useful for cutting reflections from the windscreen and the dash and um, general glare in the outside environment. It just clips on like that. So polarizing filters always cut a, a certain amount of light from a scene, uh, much like sunglasses. Uh, so this is another reason that I considered the low light performance of the camera to be important. Okay, so it uses a uh, USB connector for power, um, which just clips into the side like that. If you don't have the GPS mount, or if you do have the GPS mount, you get a slightly superior design as it will go in like that and then the cable can disappear uh, and be hidden more easily. Um, and it also uses the USB for data connectivity with the computer for accessing the, um, the memory card. Uh, I don't really like the USB power part of that um, for a few reasons. Uh, it means that you have to use an external power supply, like this uh, cigarette lighter phone charger plug that comes with it as opposed to just supplying the camera directly at 12 volts straight from the car. Um, and also these um, small USB plugs are prone to wearing out over time. So right now, um, let's plug it into um, some USB 5 volts using a phone charger and have a look at it working. Do we need to press the power button? There we go. So it's on. It all looks good. So the first thing to notice is this warning beeping. And what came up um, for a few seconds at least uh, was a warning um, pertaining to the lack of a memory card being installed because there's not one right now. So this is a positive feature of this design. Uh, you want dash cams to complain loudly uh, if they're not able to do their job for any reason, uh, because typically once they're set up and installed, you just forget about them and you don't want it to just quietly die a few months later for some reason and uh, have you not realize it. So um, if something like the memory card's not working for whatever reason, you want it to squawk about it. Talking about memory cards, here's what I've bought to use with this. Now, the thing with um, dash cams is they hammer cards because they're constantly writing high bandwidth video to them. Uh, you get about three or four, three and a half hours of footage out of this um, 32 gigabyte card uh, before it gets written over again. So you need quality memory that can stand up to that constant use, constant writing. Um, and also on SD cards, uh, what you basically want is called MLC memory as opposed to the cheaper TLC. So some brands will label their MLC products something like Endurance or a Pro like the Samsung. Um, they don't uh, often actually say anywhere that it is MLC vis-a-vis uh, -vis TLC. Anyway, that's something that you can research separately uh, as it's a picture that is always changing and I don't want to give you too much that's going to go out of date too quickly. Now, before I go any further, the first thing I'm going to do, and I suggest you might want to do too, is uh, upgrade the camera's firmware. Now, this is the relatively new version 2 of this camera but the uh, firmware it came with is already out of date. Uh, VFO seemed to be quite active, uh, at least at the time of recording, uh, in still working on these cameras, and they're gradually iterating the firmware with fairly substantive features and improvements. So it's uh, maybe worth keeping it up to date. Um, it's easy to do. You just uh, plug the camera USB cable into your computer instead of a phone charger. Uh, which will let you access the SD card via the PC. Although I should say uh, you must um, plug the cable, uh, in the case of data connectivity, into the side of the uh, dash cam itself, not the GPS connector. It turns out that the GPS connector is uh, just for power and uh, doesn't have any data connection. Um, and then you'll uh, get the SD card come up accessible on your computer.
and then you download the uh, latest firmware file from VFO's website to the uh, root of the SD card. I'll put links below the video. And then you um, restart the camera by just uh, pulling the plug and um, putting it back in. Then it should uh, automatically sort itself out. It may take uh, 20 or 30 seconds to restart when you do that. Then I'll just um, plug this back into USB power. And we can, um, nope, wrong one. Uh, when it's um, re running, by the way, when you press the menu button, it uh, takes a photo because that's a, um, that's what you'd expect it to do, isn't it? Uh, what you need to do is stop recording by pressing the record button. And you can hear now it's hassling me that it's not recording anymore. Then you can press the menu button. And um, now we can just uh, check the firmware version. I've just upgraded it to 2.2, .2, so good. And you can go through the menu and uh, configure it how you like. The um, defaults are pretty good. Um, I would ignore some of the um, more gimmicky things like the uh, G sensor and the lane departure warning system. Uh, they're not going to be reliable and are more likely to just be annoying. Um, date and time should be uh, set by the GPS. Uh, if you have a GPS, um, in which case you just need to set the um, time zone plus 13 at the moment. There's the GPS. You can turn it on if it's off for some reason. Uh, mine got switched off when I upgraded the firmware. Uh, you can change the resolution uh, of the, um, the video format, but frankly the whole point of this camera is to uh, do 1080p uh, 60 frames per second. So I'm not entirely sure why you'd want to change it. Uh, you could maybe drop the frame rate to 30 if you wanted to lower the data usage, uh, but doubling the number of frames is, um, uh, you know, to look through in the event of an accident uh, may well prove uh, beneficial. So I will leave it at the default. Uh, you can uh, change the exposure, you can boost it or, um, or lower it if you want. Um, wide dynamic range, need to experiment with that, not sure. Parking mode, I'll talk about separately. Uh, the motion detection and um, GPS we already covered. You can switch between metric and imperial. Um, I want metric, that's the G sensor. You can change the sensitivity, lane departure warning. Um, the date stamp, uh, this is whether it's imprinted on the video, you can leave that on. Uh, GPS info stamp, um, you can have all info or just speed or just coordinates. Now I don't want speed embedded in the video. Um, maybe coordinates, not such a great idea either. Now that data is still uh, recorded uh, on the card and can be viewed in software separately. It's just not stamped into the video itself. So I would suggest that the, uh, the, the safe, safer, let's say, uh, policy there is to turn it off. Uh, you can also have the camera model stamp uh, be put into the video. Uh, you can turn off the um, internal microphone, which records cabin audio. This LED is the red LED here, which shows recording. Um, beep sound. Um, I think you want to leave that on because otherwise it'll switch off the warning sound if I understand it correctly. I'll leave it on for now. So talking about firmware again, they may well add new features in the future, which I'm not currently aware of. Uh, for example, I know that in beta versions, they're working on a uh, parking mode for this camera um, where it uses the um, internal G-Shock sensor combined with uh, motion detection in the video frame to switch between driving and parked modes. Now that's interesting, although I got this camera accepting that it didn't have a parking mode. To do a parking mode properly, you really need to have a permanent power to the camera and then also feed it the car's accessory or ignition circuit, a kind of like an audio head unit, so that it knows for sure what mode to be in. Uh, and it would also need to watch the car's battery voltage to avoid flattening it over time. So you can do that last part with separate controller boxes that you can buy. 
uh, but no firmware magic uh, done in software will um, let the A119s uh, monitor the battery because it's using this five volts dropped and regulated USB power. So really, if you want true parking capability, then you need to look at more sophisticated alternatives. Okay, let's get on with it and talk about real world use. Now the um, provided cigarette lighter power supply works fine, but I don't like having to deal with that and uh, the cable. And also the fact that the um, lighter socket may not power off and on with uh, ignition in the way that you'd want it to uh, with this particular camera. So I've hardwired mine into the car, uh, powering it off the accessory circuit, which means it turns off and on uh, at the accessory position on the ignition. I'll have a separate video covering the particulars of hardwiring in a dash cam using this 5 volt USB power supply system, so I, I won't go into the details here. Anyway, so far that's working well for me, I think. So let's look at the footage. You've already seen a bit throughout the video so far, but we'll have a closer look at it now. I'm not going to go into comprehensive comparisons and tests here. Uh, mostly because a lot of other people have uploaded sample footage from these cameras and I just don't see the need to add much to all that. So I'll just talk about my impressions. All of this is at 1080p60 and initially here we're looking at the first setup with everything at their defaults. Uh, no exposure adjustment and uh, WDR is off. I'll just say up front, the video quality from a photographic perspective is just awful. Uh, the contrast is bad, the colors are off, it's way over sharpened, it's noisy, there's bad moire everywhere you look. I mean, it's just terrible. Um, another aspect that's a little disappointing is the high degree of compression artifacting, uh, which is surprising as the video bitrate ranges from around 20 megabits per second up to as high as 25 um, and it appears to be using the high AVC profile which is actually decent for full HD video uh, and it should be getting a giving a better result than this so I think that's evidence of a cheap or a unsophisticated video encoding chip uh, however you need to remember that this is a hundred dollar camera and it's intended for recording driving incidents uh, not producing broadcast quality film and I want to emphasize this point because you see around the web a lot of criticism on this uh, topic and I think that some people have frankly unrealistic expectations. So we do need to look at it from that point of view and uh, one way to judge it accordingly is to see how well we can pick out license plates. And when we try to do that we get mixed results I would say in general um, that are very dependent on the circumstances. In good lighting, uh, when the other vehicles are reasonably close, it's very possible to get a good reading. Uh, even at oblique angles, you can uh, see how you can read all the plates on the cars in this car park, for example. Um, and you can get good enough shots of uh, people, pedestrians, uh, that they're recognizable. Uh, but if you add a little range, like with this van, uh, it can be hard. And as soon as the light goes, uh, as the camera starts lengthening out the exposure time per frame, then there's no way. Uh, notice how noisy this is uh, at night time. Um, now you're not watching the original video, remember, it'll look worse by the time you see it as it's been transcoded for the web. Uh, but it is very noisy straight off the camera. And remember, I'm using the CPL filter, which uh, definitely makes it worse as the camera has to deal with a darker picture. But you know, it's, um, it's not reasonable to expect people to take the filter on and off. So if you're going to use it at all, I feel it's reasonable to judge the camera like this. I don't want to be too harsh at the same time though. I mean, it's, you know, the footage is not exactly unusable. Here's a uh, marginal example at night. Uh, this guy here who just rolls through the stop sign and barely manages to stay in the left lane. Uh, you might be able to pick out the plate here if you needed to. Uh, it would be tricky and it might require a little bit of image processing, but I think it's possible. Here's the motorway, uh, not very fast speeds, uh, and you'll find that plates are only readable again in ideal circumstances. For example, this one's quite close and it's readable, uh, but you can see that the motion blur is um, starting to make it difficult. 
and at faster speeds, uh, especially at night, you know, there's no way you'd never get this truck's plate if you needed it. So, okay, it's probably not realistic to expect too much. And just as you'd expect, uh, the auto exposure will get confused by things like uh, bright lights, for example, another car's main beam lights shining at you, uh, turning them off completely, not really the right solution for this car, although it didn't prove the picture, didn't it? No, that's the, uh, that's the indicator. There we go. Oh god. Okay, and uh, here's a better uh, recognize the pedestrian example. Okay, so far that's been with the defaults, and uh, in the end I did uh, make one settings change, and that was just to turn WDR, or uh, Wide Dynamic Range, on. Um, that's Don't confuse that with HDR, High Dynamic Range, it's not an HDR mode. It, all it is, as far as I can tell, is an inverted S uh, sort of gamma curve applied to the picture before it's encoded. Uh, so it flattens the picture out a little by sort of boosting the blacks and dialing down the whites a little. This seems to uh, mess the color up even more, uh, but that's okay because I think it definitely does help. Uh, especially in high contrast situations, you get less apparently underexposed and overexposed areas of the picture, uh, which makes those license plates even clearer. Here the picture is washed out by the sun being directly in front of the camera, but the plate on this car that failed to give way can uh, just be made out, even at this oblique angle. And talking about sun, here are a, a few more shots driving into the sun. This is sort of low setting evening sun in a clear sky. And going from uh, sunlight to shade and then back out again. Uh, what's interesting is how quickly the auto exposure sorts itself out. I think it's quite good. Um, I've seen more expensive dash cams do a better job of this, which you'd expect. Uh, but really it's pretty good for the money and there's always you know, less than a second or so where the picture is completely useless uh, in the absolute worst of cases. So I'm being tough on this and I'm you know, trying to sort of show you its failings, but really I think it's perfectly respectable, uh, like I said, for the money. And you know, when you turn around and get that sun behind you, the picture is pretty hard to criticize. And the polarizing filter does a great job of clarifying the picture, it just deletes reflection and glare, just as you'd expect if you're a fan of, say, polarizing sunglasses. Uh, here are some more shots uh, going from shade to sun to shade to sun, you know, this time with the sun behind the car. And I, uh, again, I think the dynamicity of the camera's auto exposure is, um, is quite acceptable. This sort of picture is what you'd have to call ideal circumstances. And the same now at night time. Uh, remember, this is now with the WDR setting turned on. Uh, it, it's not enough to, you know, magically read license plates at any distance in any lighting, uh, but it's pretty good, really. The only thing that will provide that in the future, I think, is the advent of 4K camera chips, uh, along with maybe even faster lenses, and that'll just be the product of ever advancing tech. You know, so let's be patient. This is pretty good for now.